Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Dr. Joyce Yip Green is an associate professor and director of the Art Therapy Research Institute in the Master's in Marital and Family Therapy and Clinical Art Therapy program at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. She earned her Ph.D. in International Psychology, Organizations, and Systems Concentration at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Well, welcome. It's tremendous to see you again. Thanks for being here with us. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm here in sunny California. It's a little cold, but doing good. Well, I was hoping you could start us off today by telling us a little bit about how you got into the work you're doing and what drives your passion for it. Sure. Uh, Ever since I was younger, I loved talking to people. I would get phone calls. My house would be ringing off the hook uh, with friends asking for advice. And so ever since I was in elementary, junior high, I was kind of known as the the counselor of of my friend group, which is really interesting um, because I never really saw myself as that, but I just loved working with people. And uh, so that got me into the field of um, counseling and therapy. Uh, I'm actually licensed as a marriage and family therapist with a specialized training in clinical art therapy. Uh, I'm a board certified registered art therapist I currently teach as a professor in the graduate department of marriage and family therapy um, at Loyola Marymount University. And uh, there we centralize art therapy um, in our work as mental health practitioners. I've worked in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County, uh, pretty much all my life. That's where I live currently, but I have been working in the community, um, working all across the lifespan. Um, my specialization is in infant mental health. So I uh, apply a dyadic framework with uh, parents and young children. And so I've done work all my life in community supporting infants and toddlers. Um, so that brought me, you know, after working in the fields um, in community-based mental health in South Los Angeles for about 15, 20 years, I moved into more policy making and um, worked uh, for an organization that specializes in uh, treatment of infants and toddlers. And um, from there, I, I decided to, to think about um, culture. You know, during that time in, in the 80s and 90s, you know, we were really focused on cultural competence and uh, cultural development. And I remember when working with the with the babies, especially in infant mental health, we, I realized that a lot of the evidence based models that we were using didn't really pay attention to cultural practices. And so I decided to go back to school and uh, study international psychology, and that took me to Rwanda, where I completed my dissertation uh, examining socialization goals and parenting beliefs of Rwandan infant caregivers. And that was uh, an amazing experience um, in looking at the way that attachment um, is done across cultures. And so that's that's a, actually a, a passion of mine, is, is understanding uh, different ways that uh, humans develop cross-culturally. And attachment. And attachment, and yeah. and it's I, it's fascinating, and I wonder if you could um, help, help me understand, help us understand how you might integrate art therapy into that. Great question. So, um, art therapy is a modality, and it's uh, I mean I I integrate art therapy in everything that I do. Actually, right there's art as therapy, and there's art in therapy. And there's so many ways that individuals uh, express, they connect through art, right? So art in itself, the the process of art making facilitates expression. It facilitates um, a connection to the unconscious processes, right? 
but it could also be done um, as a relational tool. So I've utilized art therapy, working with couples, working in groups with individuals um, all across the lifespan. So with children and adults and couples and groups. And so the way that art could be used dyadically is with, let's say, a caregiver and their baby um, or a caregiver and their child, you know. Um, so much of, of human development and child development is done through play. And so when I bring art materials to a dyad, like a, care, a, a mother and, and their toddler, let's say, and bring art materials for them to explore together, for them to play, they begin to communicate through that play, through that expression, through the creation of of different feelings and emotions and, and actions and reactions. And so um, it, it becomes another language. And so what kind of uh, modalities do you use? I mean, when you say you bring the tools of the art into that dyad, what would that look like? Is it always just paper right. and, and markers or is it, no, is it we, clay or there are toys? What's, do you do sand tray work? What do you do? Absolutely. We, uh, we utilize all different forms of, of art, right? All, all different types of materials. And there's a continuum, right? Depending on the developmental level, the, um, the physical abilities of the, the individual, the child or the parent, you know, I mean, you, you could create anything, right? And a lot of times um, I will invite children and their parents to explore different materials, right? Because so much of, of uh, art making is kinesthetic. So depending if they're wanting to use clay or they're wanting to do something with their hands or wanting to create something together, you know, we could um, bring um, newspapers for them to twist and tear and glue together and build. Um, I've brought, well, you know, basic materials are markers and pencils and paper and collage materials so that they, you know, and glue sticks and scissors. But, um, but I also love using kinesthetic materials like fabrics and pom-poms and, and string. And, you know, there's, there's beautiful ways that uh, parent and child could work together creating structures, you know, they, they can make blankets that cover each other and so, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. It's, it's really allowing the clients to lead together what they need in order to create that connection. So that's what I've done with in dyadic work with parents and caregivers. And then the result is that people feel more connected as a result that's of right. a session like that, to play together and, and the creativity. And then it, you as a therapist, um, while you're not creating the communication, I would assume that at times you can facilitate the, the understanding between the two or, or more people about what each of them is trying to communicate. Exactly, exactly. So my role as the therapist is first to understand, right, what is the goal? And the art is that facilitator of expression, of connection, of working out conflicts, perhaps, of bringing understanding and self-understanding of, of the impact of, let's say, an experience or um, a relationship. Something else is sticking in my mind from what you said earlier. You said something about different or, or you said attachment goals in Rwanda or another place and how they may be different. Can you give us an example of what you've learned about how from culture to culture attachment goals might be different? Hmm. I, I discovered many surprises in my my time in Rwanda. And first of all, it's it's the assumptions that we make about what good attachment is, right? In the United States and in, in Western cultures, the expectation is that, for instance, uh, tummy time. You know, we, we're we're taught that babies need tummy time, and uh, and so you know, typically a mother would put their um, their baby on their stomachs in order to build back muscles and to help develop their their strength and 
um, and their neck, you know, their ability to, to raise their neck. And, uh, and that is a very appropriate and, and typical way that, that we encourage infant development. In other countries, you know, it's, it's not necessarily uh, advisable to put your baby on the ground. And so what I discovered is that in, um, in Rwanda, they carry their babies on their back. And they're often carrying their babies constantly, you know, when they're walking to the store, um, when they're walking and doing their house chores or, or, or visiting uh, with their neighbors, they carry their baby on their back. And it was interesting because when I asked the mothers, why do you carry your babies on your backs? Or, you know, I, 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 as they were describing to me and they said, well, what do you mean? You don't carry your baby on your back? <laughs> and so that was really interesting. Uh, that was a, kind of one of those aha moments because the, the, the assumptions that we bring into um, different spaces. And they said, well, how do you carry your baby? And I, well, I, I carry my baby in the front, you know, we have our, you know, in, in the West here, we, we have our the front uh, packs, baby, yeah, the baby wraps, right? <laughs> right? Our baby carriers. And, um, and then we, you know, even have like our, what do you call them? Their strollers, the strollers yeah. right? But for them, and they taught me that the way of wrapping, and they said that it's so important to carry the baby on the back because it reduces, um, uh, what's that? Uh, their stomach, uh, what is that called? We call it like GERD. But stomach the, di digestion acid, digestion acid reflux problems acid, re yes thank you yes so it reduces acid reflux it it you know helps them um, with their their digestion and and it also it to them it it helps them to with build posture up their yeah posture yeah exactly and um, so I thought that was really uh, really fascinating and and they taught me the whole process of of tying the baby with a blank, you know, blanket around their back and their legs are stretched out. But um, what's equally important is after they carry their baby on their backs, they have to go through a process of stretching. And so, you know, cause you know, once they're constricted, right, it's important to kind of stretch. So they have the whole ritual after carrying their, their back, you know, they immediately, you know, take the baby out when they're nursing or, and then they do a process of stretching to make sure that their limbs are straightened to prevent um, bow leggedness. And so that's what I learned um, from interviewing the, the uh, infant caregivers. And, um, and it was really eye opening the, well, um, the different practices. And there's a, the, the implication from a lot of people is that our way is better, right? So would, whatever, wherever you are, your, your way is better. And from the Western world, there's a lot of this FaceTime. If my baby's here facing me, we have that interaction, cooing, talking. Right. Whereas if the baby's on my back, we don't have that much FaceTime. And so the implication is there's going to be a difference in the way that we bond or connect. That's right. Right. But there's also that value of that constant touch, right? And so in many of the uh, collectivist cultures where the, the mother's role is to attend to the baby's needs, if the baby cries, you pick them up, you don't hesitate. There's, there's co-sleeping. Co-sleeping is also um, a value in, in many collectivist cultures. And so, you know, in the West here, we, we talk about, um, you know, let the baby cry it out. So the baby will sleep, you know, in their own room, in a crib. Um, but oftentimes in, in cultures all around the world, they they sleep with their baby right on, on top of them. Yeah, it is amazing all the differences. And how, you know, uh, did you find that there's a different level of connection and um, kind of attachment or simpatico between um, children and, and their parents in Rwanda than there was here? The cultural values in Rwanda is very much about respecting your elders and respecting your parents. And so I, I did not see many children um, being disrespectful to their parents or talking back. And in fact, you know, in every um, environment that I was in and, and interacting with children, 
they very much so listened to their parents. And, um, you know, even at, during meals, we, I would I would be sitting with teenagers and they would wait for their parents to eat before, you know, before they took their first bite. And um, so it, it really is um, socially constructed, right? This idea of, um, of culture and um, what's expected within cultural contexts. So that, that's, that's what I really appreciated about um, international psychology is that understanding that it really is cul- cultural and, and context bound. So when we work with families and um, especially here, you know, when we're working with immigrant families or um, families from uh, who aren't from here, uh, um, from other countries, maybe uh, the the work that I've done with uh, refugees and, and immigrants has taught me that, that we need to be aware of how we import our own Western ideals and values into the counseling space. Yeah, it would seem to be, uh, to me, to be a specific set of challenges to try to honor the culture that they came from at the same time help them function within this culture and these expectations, which can sometimes be radically different. Right. Right. And I think we need time and space to explore that together, don't we? With with the families that we work with is is to learn from, first of all, their perspective, their understandings, um, how they operate in the world and and whether or not there's any tensions or um, or conflicts within that experience. And um, sometimes there are. Sometimes there aren't, but uh, what I find is is more so is that intergenerational right um, relationships that sometimes can be problematic or or, or cause tensions within um, immigrant families, especially if the younger generation gets acculturated in this culture and they're going home to a very different culture. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, which is the impetus. And, you know, we talk about my passions and all that, um, you know, because I myself am an immigrant. Um, I actually came over from Laos when I was two years old um, during the, um, the Civil War. And um, when the Patat Lao, um, the communists took over Laos, we all needed to, to leave the country. And so we, we came over and um, my experience as an, as an immigrant coming to America, trying to learn the language and, you know, myself at that time developing a list and um, the teachers in, in my kindergarten, my kindergarten teachers would instruct my parents to only speak to me in English and, um, and, you know, put me in speech and language um, classes. And, and I think there was little, very little understanding about bilingualism and the importance of supporting um, cultures and cultural values. And so as a result, I lost so much of my language abilities in, in Lao. And so part of the work that I'm doing now um, and, and the research that I'm embarking on is interviewing elders who came over during that time period, you know, in in the 70s and 80s from Laos. And I'm focusing right now on the elders and to explore their experiences of acculturation, of adaptation. And then secondly, um, I'll be interviewing the children who came over and hopefully we can glean um, some understanding of the differences in adaptation. Those, those that would be roughly your age, you mean? Yes. <laughs> yes. And what, so, year, what year did you come over? 1975. Okay. Yeah, that was during a time of um, immigration. That was the, the, the Indo-Chinese um, Immigration Act in the United States where the, the U.S., uh, welcomed so many uh, refugees and I- immigrants from that part of the world. And um, so we saw a large influx of uh, refugees and immigrants from Southeast Asia. Now, um, 
one reason why I'm embarking on this research is also to help build that awareness of the resilience of immigrant populations and refugees um, and what's needed to support them. And, and what I'm discovering is, of course, I mean, we, we can already guess, but um, one thing is the importance of community and cultural communities and also the importance of religion and faith. And so, um, you know, I, I'm examining the, the Lao people from Laos, but I'm also interviewing um, elders from South Korea. And because not all Asians are, are alike. And so I, I wanted to do a cross-cultural study to kind of show the similarities and differences of two Asian groups to come over from their respective countries at the same time during the same kind of socio-political context of war and so, so their if, experience in America. So mm -hmm. how old were your parents when they brought you over? My, let's see, my mom was 25 and my dad was 36. Yeah, he was 30. Yeah, he was 10 years, about 10 years older than, than she was. Than she is, yeah. Amazing. So lots of turbulence, lots of change, change of culture, change of land, and then trying to get, you know, the, the children, how many children did they have? My parents have, have two children, me and my brother. And, um, you know, right when we came to the United States, we, uh, well, we, we came over, um, you know, with a travel visa. Um, we were able to secure that, you know, temporary travel visa. And then we applied for asylum or refugee status. And so we were able to get some support um, in that, uh, through that policy. And uh, from there, my parents worked. They uh, went through the system, uh, the community college system, and, lear and learned the language. And my mom worked two jobs. And my dad um, uh, also worked um, a lot. And uh, we lived in Los Angeles in uh, the, the Western. I, I'm not sure. You're, you're not from California, are you? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in, in Los Angeles, we, you know, we lived in um, close to downtown LA and um, in the metro area, and then eventually moved out to the suburbs as my dad um, made more money. And um, eventually he became a business owner and established his own travel agency. And, uh, and my mom, you know, started working for a big, big bank and, uh, and we've, we've done, they've done, I'm very proud of them. They've done very well for themselves. And, and, and I have to say it, it, if it wasn't for the community and there, there's a group of um, Lao uh, community members that they're, that came over with them and who are very close with them now and they support each other. They spend time together to this very day. Wonderful. Well, so the current, you, you're talking about doing research. So you're on one hand, you're spending some of your time doing research right now. And the rest of your time, what, what's the predominant use of your time? Are you, are you in actual doing the clinical work with the marriage and family therapy? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I am a faculty member um, at Loyola Marymount University in the graduate department of marriage and family therapy with specialized training in art therapy. And I'm also a practitioner. I um, have a private practice where I see clients. Um, I do most of my work uh, through telehealth. So I have a, a telehealth practice and I also work um, as part of, I think you interviewed uh, Karen Brown from Link International. And so I am one of the co-founders of uh, Infinity Link International. So we're, we're doing, we're doing a lot. I see clients, I teach, I consult, um, and I speak to people like you <laughs> on, on your podcast. Well, thank so. you for that. So, um, did you do the telehealth even before the pandemic years? I did actually, I got into telehealth, um, even before pandemic, I would say three years before pandemic and it wasn't, um, it wasn't done very much um, in the field. And, 
And I, I had some really good colleagues who, you know, invited me and, and asked if I would take that risk um, because they found it to be very beneficial um, to reach um, a wider group of people. And, um, and I, I have found that, that that allowed me and helped me to um, really understand the nuances of telehealth. And then when the pandemic hit, my practice boomed. I mean, you know, my wait list was still is, you know, six to eight months out, but, um, but definitely uh, the telehealth has provided so much more access to mental health services. Um, and I mean, I would see people while they were sick with COVID at, I mean, how many times was I able to, to still work with individuals who were self-isolating um, yeah. due to, due to COVID. Yeah, it was a yeah. tremendous benefit there. For sure. Well, so kind of a summary overview. If you think in terms of um, what I've asked you about already and the, the work you do and, and what you have the most passion for, what's something that maybe I haven't even asked you about yet that you want to make sure we cover? Well, I, you know, one thing that I really want to encourage everyone, um, especially practitioners, right, is this commitment to self-reflection, how important it is. And, and I, I teach my students this, I apply this, is the importance of cultural humility. Um, and not just cult cultural humility, but, you know, what we at Link International talk about is cultural honesty, right? Being honest with yourself about your assumptions and your biases and your viewpoints, um, but also be open to the viewpoints of others. And um, so I, I think when, especially when we're working with other cultures and, and people who, um, who grew up differently than, than we did, and, and that might even be part of the same culture. We can't assume that just because you know, my client, th that I'm, if I'm working with a client who is from Laos or from, from China or Asian, that we're the same, right? So um, I think understanding culture and context understanding the unique experiences that people have. Um, how did they come to where they are today, where they are now? I think that's so important to not take for granted um, and don't assume that we know how people arrived to where they are, no matter what ethnicity or what cultural background they are. And, and so to take that time to explore that uh, is very important, I think, in the work that we do to understand the human experience. And um, and I think it, it can also help in building connections with our clients. It can also allow us to, to understand some of those nuances because there's so much that is unsaid. And that's one thing that I'm, I've learned in my experience is that individuals, especially uh, immigrants, um, people who are from other cultures, they hold a lot of secrets, right? There are a lot of things that there's a belief that, um, that you have to be careful what, to, what you say um, or how you say it, right? And so I think allowing yourself that time and space to explore some of those nuances of, of what is spoken and what's unspoken is very important. So, and it's tricky at times. Well, yeah, and it, and it's tricky at times because you might want to ask somebody, and they may feel like it's intrusive for you to ask. So, on the other hand, uh, I was working with somebody recently who, in his um, late fifties, went to a, a drug and alcohol rehab center and uh, left the state he lived in and went out there. And uh, he was telling me that he had a very um, let's call it prideful view of himself and better than others, et cetera. And mostly it's out of defense techniques, but he found out interacting with the other uh, people getting treatment out there that they had a far more flexible, playful, inclusive childhood than he had. And, mm -hmm. and they're all basically from the same, you know, Americans with Americans kind of thing, but, he had assumed that the rigid, controlled, I mean, one of, the, one of the things he said was, you know, we never played any games. So people were 
kind of ribbing him saying, well, don't you, how could you not know that? And he said, finally, just give up and said, I, I never played any games. I never had any friends over. I never did. So that, that his personal family culture was dramatically different than most of the people that he grew up in. There's the very, what you would assume is the same culture. Right. So it was radically different. Yeah. So we can't make assumptions, right? That we understand another person's culture. But I think inviting that dialogue and exploration together uh, can really enhance our understanding um, and make it so much easier for us to support others in their wellness. Well, and there have been a variety of tools that people have tried to develop over the years, whether they're card games or interactive questioning games that help people explore. So, you know, what's what was your family like? What was your culture like? What was your what, what was acceptable? What wasn't acceptable? What are your secrets? What you know, the, and in a playful way, helping people facilitate the kind of communication that we aren't really trained into doing. So we mm. get to know each other better. We get to know ourselves better. We get to know the differences between the family we were raised in or, or the culture we were raised in and another culture. Yeah, and and I think that's the beauty of the work that we do right, is, is that ability to, to understand one another in multiple different ways. Wonderful. Well, I thank you so much for being willing to share with us today and help us expand our awareness of learning about ourselves and other cultures and uh, the role of art therapy in your work. And I'm just honored. I'm thanking you for your time and your attention. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Blessings. Dr. Joyce Yip Green is an associate professor and director of the Art Therapy Research Institute in the Masters in Marital and Family Therapy and Clinical Art Therapy program at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. She earned her PhD in International Psychology, Organizations and Systems Concentration at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. For over 20 years, Dr. Green has worked as a licensed marriage and family therapist and clinical art therapists serving individuals and families across the lifespan. She currently holds a telehealth practice in the state of California. Her extensive experience includes program oversight of community-based programs serving children 0 to 5 and their families, as well as the mental health programs at several community college health centers in Los Angeles County. Dr. Green has presented nationally and internationally on her cultural research examining development in cultural contexts. Professor Green's current research utilizes art-based methodologies to examine the experiences of immigration and acculturation, particularly those who have been impacted by war and displacement from Laos and South Korea. She is the co-founder of Infinity Link, L-I-N-C, International, an organization that supports organizations in developing cultural bridges. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening. 